happy Sunday. It's wonderful to see everybody today. We are so glad you're here. Um, just two things, word of instruction. If you need bathrooms, they're through this door that's being closed right there. Um, and we do have, during the sermon time, a class for little kids under first grade, back through those double doors. So when that time comes, you'll see a few people stand up and go back there. You're welcome to have your kids join. They're welcome to stay with you. We love having kids in here with us too. So that is it. And I'm going to turn it over to Caleb. And you can change your mic batteries too. We're going through them like a bacon on a church morning potluck. So how is everyone? Isn't the weather, weather beautiful? But we're not here to talk about the weather. Although it is glorious. I've got some very bittersweet news today. Um, one of our youth volunteers, Marie Murray, I know you absolutely love being in the spotlight. She's been teaching our, our youth over the past year to uh, worship, and uh, she brings her guitar and has really helped create a culture of uh, worship and reflection on who Jesus is and, and the power of God. Well, she and her husband are moving to Nashville, Tennessee to pursue some music opportunities out there. So we're happy for her and we're bummed for us. And um, there's going to be a little shindig out of Hooker Oak Park from 2 to 6 where if you want to just go and thank her or drop in, um, if you know Marie and uh, Saxon, uh, her husband, who's going to be here at the end of uh, the service today as well. Um, you can go out just to support and say uh, thank you to them. So that's from uh, 2 to 6, again, at a Hooker Oak Park. And you guys will be hanging out, throwing water balloons at people who come to say hi. Something like that. <laughs> Some other bittersweet news. Um, and this is, this is a, a toughie. And that is our uh, apprentice and intern, Everett, whom we all love got accepted into Denver Seminary and got a full ride scholarship and Denver is not anywhere near Chico. So after he and Alyssa, and Alyssa, who's bright red right now because we're talking about them, also got accepted into a residency internship out near Denver. So after they get married in June, they're going to be moving out there and we're going to have a farewell party for them in um, like a month and a half, and we're going to celebrate them appropriately. But um, just as all the the stuff was bittersweet this morning, we thought we'd pack all the, the bitter together and wrap it in a tidy bow of <laughs> sweetness. Of, of sweetness. <laughs> it is a bummer, but we also get to celebrate lives that get to impact other people, um, not just our fellowship and our community but um, the broader family of Christ. So we are thankful for them, and uh, more will be said about that later. So Psalm 95 this morning, just as a way to center our hearts and our minds, says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. The rock of our salvation. Do we not need a rock? In the current political climate, in the current wave of everything shifting like sand, God is a rock. He is faithful through all generations and he never changes. The rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all the gods. In his hands are the depths of the, the earth and the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and let us bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God. We are sheep of His pasture, the sheep of His hand. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden 
your hearts. There is an opportunity this morning to hear the voice of God, to come into his presence, to embody what it means to be a sheep. A sheep trusts its shepherd. A sheep goes where the shepherd leads, leading to good pasture, to quiet streams, to green fields. And I think this morning God would lead us into a place of trust. A place where we are able to declare in the depths of our soul, you are our rock. You are my salvation. Whom have I in heaven and earth but you, God? So let's stand. Let's declare those truths together.
led me to Christ, um, he, he had the wisdom, he got me, got me all started off, he gave me, you know, some scriptures to memorize, told me, sort of, sort of filling me in and my brothers, like, this is what the Christian life looks like. And one of the things he told me, that I'm so glad he did, in, in a little piece of wisdom, is he said, I don't want to pop your bubble, he didn't pop my bubble, because I was flying high that moment, he said, but, he goes, those bubbles are going to pop on their own. You're going to start going down the road and you're going to run into these things and they're called trials. <laughs> and, and But he, he told me that it's okay. They're a good thing. They're, it's all right. Like just And he, he got my expectations in line. And that turned out to be very helpful because he was right. And sure enough, before long, there were trials. And that's pretty much been life ever since, right? <laughs> the, the highest of victory and then here comes the next trial. Today we come almost to the end of this of this of the Exodus series that we're doing. Next week we will we will finish, but not finish the book of Exodus. We're going to take a break and go to Colossians, and then we're going to come back another time and finish the book of Exodus. But today uh, is strangely enough the climax of the Exodus story. Now, if you didn't know the story you'd have thought, wait a minute, we just had the climax. Like, a couple of weeks ago, Caleb uh, took us through the, the tenth act of judgment against Egypt and its gods, which finally breaks the will of Pharaoh, 
and they, the, the Egyptian people are like, get out of here, you know, take our gold and silver and get out, we're done with you. The slaying of the firstborn had happened, uh, Israel was spared because of the Passover. This was a great deliverance. This is the great deliverance. Jesus himself links his own death to the Passover. We did the Seder meal. Mean, that was the deliverance, right? Well, part two today. And the one that uh, the movie makers love, right? <laughs> you know, they do a little time on the Passover part, but that's kind of dark and creepy. And so, but they love this part. And this is only four of the de depictions of uh, the parting of the Red Sea and Israel going through the Red Sea and the Egyptians chasing them and then comes the water and Egypt, is, uh, the armies of Egypt are destroyed and, and that's the victory. So, big climax. But today we're going to see through this story, and it is an exciting story when you read it, um, the dynamics of deliverance, how God's deliverance works, not just then, but ever since, and particularly for us as followers of Jesus, uh, a real insight into the way deliverance works. So let's dive in and have a look, starting right from the, the Passover has happened, they're running them out. Uh, this is chapter uh, 13, verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road towards the Red Sea. So, we need a map. Uh, they're living up here in the land of Goshen. All the ten acts of judgment happen. They finally leave. We have here various theorized routes of the Exodus. Nobody knows exactly which way. But one way we know they didn't go was this way. This is called the way of the Philistines. That's what it says. He did not lead them by the way of the Philistines. This way was also called the Great Trunk Road by the people back then, the different civilizations. The Egyptians called it the way of Horus. Uh, it is obviously the short route. If you're going to go to Canaan, you just go right straight up. It takes a matter of weeks. You can get up there and just get it done. Uh, the problem is, if you didn't know it already, Israel, which is Canaan, is the uh, kind of the crossroads between three continents, Europe, Asia, Africa. If you're going to get from Europe or Asia into Africa or vice versa, you've got to go through Israel. And if you're going to do it, you're going to do it along this road because it's by the Mediterranean, it's easier, or trade routes, all of that. This is a big old wilderness, you don't want to go that way. But because this was the main road, it was heavily fortified, heavily defended. And so God's like, not going to take them that way. Why does he say that? What's his concern? I mean, God can take care of armies, right? But his concern, he says, is that they may change their minds and return to Egypt. This becomes a theme throughout the Old Testament, and it carries on into the New Testament as a metaphor. That Egypt is a symbol for their past bondage, and it becomes a symbol for our past bondage, our slavery to sin. And God's concern is that when faced with something like that, that they're going to change their mind and say, I want to go back. I want to go back to the old. I want to go back to my slavery, back to my bondage. This is, for us, the old man, as we call it, the way of the flesh, the broken way. Um, our past, our, our, our habits, our hang-ups, our addictions, or whatever it is that, that has put us in bondage that we came to Christ for to be saved from. That's what Egypt represents. And God is concerned that we would want to go back that way. So he takes then what is called the roundabout way, the long way, uh, the way of the wilderness, the way of the desert, and the point being here is that with God, there's no shortcuts. What for us looks like, look, it's right there. Can I just go that way? God knows better. And it's not just that he just has something against shortcuts. There's actually a purpose to this. God uses the wilderness to prepare his people. But what's he preparing them for? He's preparing them for the destination. It's not just about the destination. He wants to prepare us for the destination. In their case, the promised land. For us, it's the kingdom of God. 
And by that I don't just mean go to heaven. I'm talking about the new heaven, the new earth. We are being prepared as God's people to be God's people, to, to live in His kingdom of love the way He designed us. And how does He prepare us? Well, He leads us through the wilderness, and that's this world. This wilderness. It's easy to see this world as a wilderness with all of the struggles and trials that we have here. But this is how God forms us. We've talked about this before, the detours of our life. They seem like detours, but they turn out to be um, God's way of, of getting His will done. I mean, sometimes you've got to go to Omaha to find your way back <laughs> here, you know. Detours. Oh, by the way, Red Sea, uh, just a quick note on that. What is the Red Sea? So, you, you know, this idea of leading them to and then through the Red Sea. Again, scholars don't really know, but the water here it looks just different than it did 3,000 years ago. There's all these speculations, you, you know, all those documentaries on Netflix and online and everything. There's a whole bunch of different things said. Uh, first of all, it's the Sea of Reeds is the proper translation from the Hebrew, not Red Sea. And, and that's important because it's really what the, what the writer's trying to get you to do is not so much get hooked on like where and all that, but to make a connection back to Moses. Moses was, remember, drawn from the reeds. He was delivered from the Nile at a time when Pharaoh was trying to kill the baby boys. And so his deliverance mirrors the deliverance that's about to happen for Israel, being, being saved through the Sea of Reeds. Uh, is it this? There's like the Gulf of Aqaba, the Gulf of Suez. Uh, that's these two. Some people think they went across this little lake. Uh, you know, there's, and then of course people are, you know, did it happen? How did it happen? And you know, the, I don't know if you've ever heard the funny story, the, the skeptical scholar standing before the audience, that this was not a miracle. You know, the Bible says a wind came in blue and pushed it aside. So it was probably about six to eight inches of water and so it pushed it aside, and some little lady in the back raised her hand and says, well, it's still a miracle, because God drowned the Egyptian army in six inches of water. <laughs> <laughs> so there's all this kind of discussion, and, and, and again, and obviously from the text, it, Hollywood likes to do it up, you know, like make the, that wall of water huge. We don't know all the details, but God clearly did a miracle, and, and save the people, but you really want to stay focused in on the imagery and what it means to really get the gist of the story. Uh, but it, the point being, this is the roundabout way. Okay, so he's going to move them on. Let's see what it says next. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Pi Hahiroth between Migdal and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea directly opposite Baal Zephon. Pharaoh, Pharaoh will think, the Israelites, Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will strengthen, that's our word here, I will strengthen Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. But I will get glory through Pharaoh and all his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord, Yahweh. So the Israelites did this. <coughs> so what does God do? Instead of taking them the short route, but that might make them lose heart, he takes them where? He plants them between the sea and the desert. Between chaos and emptiness. Remember, what does sea represent in the Old Testament? The sea represents chaos. And the desert, the wilderness, represents emptiness. So the roundabout way isn't necessarily an easy way. The roundabout way is not a cakewalk. But one of the things you should get from this section is God has this whole thing planned. This does not escape it. He's, he's telling them to do this. He's setting this up. Okay? God knows how to deal with chaos and emptiness. Your mind should be hopping back to Genesis 1. This is one of those Bible hyperlinks where you should go back and you should be thinking of the creation. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth, and it was what? Formless and void, chaotic and empty. And God brings order from the chaos and He fills the void. Redemption, deliverance, salvation is creation or recreation. And that's what's about to happen here. And that is also the metaphor for what's done for us in Jesus, as we're going to see. And so he's setting it up. 
When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds. And again, he's heard that they're now camp, you know, stuck out there in the desert by the sea. And he said, what have we done? We have let the Israelites go and we have lost their services. We lost our labor force. The Lord strengthened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pi, Hahiroth, opposite Baal, Zephon. Now, why does it say they're marching out boldly? Well, because, again, they just had a deliverance, right? They had this amazing thing happen. We, we read, we heard about the Egyptians who thrust them out, given them, like, gold and silver, so they plundered the Egyptians. They, they are, like, walking out, like, yeah, we are free, free from our slavery. 400 years of oppression is over. And we're not just out, we're out with a bunch of stuff from Egypt. We're on our way, we're, we're mar marching out boldly. Victory. And now watch what happens. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They, the Israelites, were terrified, and they cried out to the Lord. And then they said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die here in the desert. What a change from boldness to terror. And this, you guys, is a picture, you see this repeated over and over and over, not only in the first five books of Moses, throughout the whole Testament, and unfortunately, in our own lives. This is what I would call the deliverance cycle. Very simply, it's going from deliverance to the next difficulty, <laughs> right? And you, the thought is, when you get delivered, is it's all done and good, and all my problems are behind me, and I'm just going to sail on until, you know, Jesus comes back, and then you run into a difficulty. Now, in the midst of this is our reaction. So after deliverance, we experience delight. The dance, you know, yay, like victory, boldly marching forth. We're happy, everything's good. And then we hit the difficulty, and that leads to uh, some form of despair. Actually, a whole lot of D words. <laughs> <laughs> Disappointment, doubt, discouragement, defeat, dread, depression. There's probably more that you could add to that. Where we are, we find ourselves stuck hurting, um, in trouble. And folks, this is life. And this is the Christian life. This is what that guy warned me of when I was only 11 years old. That this is what's going to happen. It's going to happen over and over and over again. This is the roundabout way. And it sometimes feels like a roundabout. <laughs> you know, round and round it goes. And what is the lie that goes through our head when we get caught in that, this section, where we're facing the difficulty, we're caught in the despair, or the doubt, discouragement, or one of those things. The lie in our head is to go back to our bondage. The temptation is always to go back to our bondage. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die here in the desert. What do I mean by that? We're back to our bondage. For some reason, the to us, the unhealthy familiar is always more desirable than the healthy unknown. No matter how good it is, if it's unknown, it's scary. Um, you know, examples are given. Uh, prisoners, you, you've often heard the story of people that are in prison who, who get out. And they've been there for years and they get out. And they don't know what to do with their freedom. They don't know how to live free. And they go out and they deliberately commit another crime just so they can be put back in prison because it's safe there to them. I mean, prison, safe, really? It's a lie, but they don't know what to do with their freedom. And nobody has taught them how to be free, what to do with their freedom. So the million-dollar question is, when you're in this zone, so you're, you've hit the difficulty, now you're in the midst of all the emotion that goes with it, what do you do? 
And here's Israel, literally caught between a rock and a hard spot, and here comes the Egyptian army. They're caught between three things. What does one do? When you're hemmed in on every side, the desert, the sea, chaos and emptiness, overcome with one of these deeds, and the Egyptian army, meaning the temptation of your flesh to go and deal with this your way, the old way, to go back to whatever way you used to rely on, is there. What should you do? And here's where the story gets really interesting. Because we're going to get two answers that look like they contradict each other. Which means, as you know, this is Dave's favorite part of the story, right? Because what is it? It's attention, yes. We're going to see attention. So we get two answers, one right after another. First from Moses, and then from God. Let's start with Moses. So the people just cried out, right? They went from bold to, ah, we're terrified. What are we going to do? We should have stayed in Egypt. Moses says to them, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance that the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Wonderful words. You hear this one quoted all of this. one of those ones that makes it up on a Hobby Lobby sign, you know, in your house. Great, great one. Be still. Stand firm. Just watch God do it. God has this. He's going to take care of it. He's going to deal with these Egyptians. You don't have to do anything. <sighs> and then God speaks. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to get moving. <laughs> and you, Moses, raise your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. As for me, God says, I will harden, strengthen the hearts of the Egyptians so they will go in after them. And I will get glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I get glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. So which is it? Moses says, be still, stand firm, be at peace, watch God do it. God says, why are you crying out to me? Get off your butts and get moving. <laughs> Um, is this a contradiction? No, this is not a contradiction. Again, we, we talked about the concept in the past of what, we're, what we call dual causation. Remember, God is the primary cause of these things, and we are real secondary causes. And even in our deliverance, we have a role to play. We saw this with the Seder meal, we saw this at the Passover, um, when Caleb covered that, that while God was the one who delivered them, they participated. They killed the lamb, they put the blood on their doorpost. How do these two combine? What does this mean? It's important that we understand that we, while we both have roles, our roles are different, very different. What Moses says is true and what God says is true. And the combination creates a trust-driven action. That's what you get. That's why what Moses says first is so important. You start with finding that place of trust. Be still, don't fear, and recognize that God is going to be the one who brings the deliverance. And out of that trust, you move. There's a huge difference between action that's based in fear versus action that comes from trust, and God is our deliverer. Action based in fear is, you know, I'm terrified, stuck between the sea and the desert, and here come the Egyptians, and I need to do something, and I anxiously, fearfully try to deliver myself and do it my way. The other is, no, God is going to do this, and now I will act in that trust. It's a trust that leads to an obedience, where God has given you, God has shown you, oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. To do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God, or, or some particular action that you know you need to do to be faithful, and you just do that. You just start moving. But we'll see some more as we go, how this looks. Then the angel of God, who had a few verses before, I didn't read it, but the, the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud, was going before them and led them to this place. So it was in front of them. 
And it says, the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to one side, the Egyptians, and light to the other. So neither went near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. Again, major, major hyperlink to Genesis 1, the separation of light and darkness. Uh, the, the wind, the same word wind is spirit in Hebrew, is wind blowing over the seas. The separating of the waters and then dry land appears. It's exactly what happens in Genesis 1. God creating, God delivering. And the first step here of God's deliverance is to go from the front, move to the back, and become a rear guard. To protect, to, to separate the light from the darkness. To, 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 uh, to create a separation between our new creation and our old creation. And to guard us, to guard them from their past. This past that's coming and breathing down their neck. And the next step is then to begin to part the chaos. To provide a way through the chaos for the people. And I want you to picture this next part. A little short part, but this is the, this is the part, you know, again, the movie makers, well, movie makers love the parting. And now... The people go into the sea. And I want you to imagine being the people of Israel doing this. I know standing by watching it, well, this is the cool part. But imagine being them. It says, The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, and a wall of water on their right, with a wall of water on their right and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. At this point in the story, this is the center of the storm. Okay, this is this, the deliverance has not quite completely happened yet. And this is like the, you know, they say uh, it's always darkest before the dawn kind of thing. If you're an Israelite going into the sea and you've got a wall of water on the left and the right, I, I think you're probably terrified, and the Egyptians coming in after you. We'll see in a second, this, the pillar of fire has moved up above them. So that is taken away, and here come the Egyptians. They've got Egyptians behind them. The fascinating thing about this part is every, every um, side is accounted for. You've got like three negatives and, and three positives. So on the one hand, you've got two walls of chaos on either side. Again, terrifying. And you've got Egyptians breathing down your neck. For us, again, going through one of life's trials, one of life's difficulties, whatever you might be going through, God may be parting the chaos, but there it is on either side. It's scary. And your old nature, again, breathing down your neck. That old bondage, the old way, coming after your past, whatever that is, your hurts, your habits, your hang-ups, your traumas. But it's the way of bondage. It's the old oppressor coming for you. And yet, above them is God looking down. And it says it over and over and over again in this passage, and every time it tells the story in the future, they walked through on dry ground. God gave them solid ground to walk on and a way to go. Go that way. Go forward. They had one job, just walk. <laughs> just walk. God's doing the rest. God is doing the rest. And that brings us to the final act. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and clouds, if he's above, at the Egyptian army and he threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against us, against Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at daybreak, 
the dawn, the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and the horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea, not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. The old, the bondage, the slavery, our old nature, drowned in the sea. You know, we have two, two main things we do, two, whatever you call, ritual sacraments. Communion is connected to Passover. We, our communion, our, our Lord's Supper is connected, as Jesus connected it to the, the Hebrew Passover, and that deliverance. Baptism is what connects us to this deliverance. Delivered through the sea, delivered through the waters. This is the way Paul describes our baptism. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. Why? That we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. That's Egypt. Slavery. Slavery to sin. And we are no longer slaves. In the waters of baptism, those Egyptians have been done away with. We need not fear them anymore. We need not fear our past, our old nature, because now we are the children of God, the children of light. We walk in the newness of life, a life in the spirit, a life not grounded in fear, but a life grounded in, and this is the point, a life grounded in trust. The final words of the chapter say this. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord, and they put their trust in Him and in Moses, His servant. Ultimately, this is all about trust. Trust for the next round. <laughs> but not just to be round and round and round. Each round of the deliverance cycle builds that trust a little more, builds that trust a little more, and the reason for this is because trust is the key to our, our side of the redemptive process. Trust is what frees us to be able to love. Because love requires risk. Love requires courage. Love requires trusting that God has me so I can go ahead and take the risk and lay down my life. Jesus trusted in God in order to die for us on the cross. That took trust. That took trust. And it says that Jesus himself learned obedience through what he suffered throughout his life. Suffering produces endurance. Suffering produces the trust. The trust isn't just for its own sake. It is the way we show our love for God. But it's also the key to how we're able then to love one another. To become the children of God and the citizens of the kingdom. So if this story does anything for you personally, it should at least reset your expectations. The one being, and again, if, if you're on this side, you know, if you're on this side of deliverance, you know, I don't want to pop your bubble and you know, get you all worried about the future. And I probably can't because if you're rejoicing, you're rejoicing. But you should know that, you know, there's another one coming. <laughs> Through many dangerous toils and snares, I have already come, and there'll be more. But it's good. That's why the scriptures say, count it all joy when you meet these. And do not be surprised. That disappointment that comes thinking, God, I, I, I followed you. I've been faithful to you. Ever since the last deliverance, everything's been great. And I've been, why this? It's not because you did something wrong. It's because he loves you and he's trying to grow you even more. And he wants to provide you another one. Another deliverance. And that's for those of you who are here, somewhere in the difficulty or the despair, working your way, or maybe you're right in the middle of the deliverance process and you got a wall of water on this side and a wall of water on that side and your old nature screaming down your, your neck. He wants to remind you again that He is delivering you. 
and as terrifying as, or as difficult as that moment may be, you will make it to the other shore. And next week, as we finish this section of Exodus, Caleb is actually going to take us to the dance because the Israelites do stop and pause and dance in their deliverance. But that is coming each time that we find ourselves in this cycle. So when you find yourself in it, just remember the promptings of both Moses and God. Still your heart. Stand firm. Fear not. Knowing that God will deliver. And then, walk. Obey. In that trust, go forward. Go forward. And you will be dancing eventually on the other side. One last little note. And then uh, we, we, we're going to respond in worship. You guys can come on up. This gets overlooked because we're a bunch of Americans. We tend to overly individualize this thing. But the people of Israel went through the sea as the people of Israel. This journey we do together as the children of God, as the family of God. This is not a lone journey. There's a sense in which it is, you know, it's you and God. But we journey together. So rely on one another. You can't do this alone. Let's walk with each other as we go through these cycles of deliverance and trial difficulty. God will be with us. We're being delivered by a, a, a God in Christ who cares for us. He has delivered us and He will deliver us again and again and again. Let's respond to worship. <clears throat>
walk through the trials and the joys. Let's see Jesus in Have a great week.